So hello everyone, my name is Doug. I'm the Education Events Coordinator for NOFA Mass. And thank you for joining us tonight. We're excited to learn more about growing annuals for seed with Petra Page Mann. And Petra is a lifelong seed saver, author, storyteller, and co-founder of Fruition Seeds. Before we get started, I just want to thank our sponsors. We've been um, generously sponsored by all of these great organizations and we couldn't do it without them. We couldn't hold this conference without them. <clears throat> so thank them and when you, um, you know, when you go over and get some of your products from these folks, please remember to thank them again for their support of NOFA. And ground ourselves, we want to remember that we're presenting, attending, and hosting this workshop from land that was previously managed and inhabited before European colonization. And we hope that you take a moment to find your location on this great interactive ma map to honor the people who lived on this land before us. As an agricultural organization, we all want to respect the land and hopefully leave it better for the folks who come after us. Mm. And with that, I hope you all get to enjoy the workshop. So I'll introduce mm -hmm. Petra here and say hello. Why, hello. I am so <laughs> delighted to join you all today and welcome to the summer of life not exactly being what it used to be and will ever be again but here we are making serious lemonade and thank you nofa and thank you doug and thank you all for coming this is amazing <laughs> to be here with you tonight and that i'm going to share a bunch of info and at any time jump into the chat let doug know let us all know what you're thinking about especially if you have clarifying questions you're not the only one and if you have bigger stories you, you that you'd love to share i am way more interested in sharing a dialogue with you all than simply just sitting here and having a monologue so without further ado i have some questions for you all first and foremost and let's just drop into the chat how many of you <laughs> love to eat food and garden <laughs> a unanimous show of hands <laughs> but how many of you how many of you have saved seeds before this yes no unintentionally intentionally and how many of you have bred brand new varieties that the world has never seen before of vegetables herbs flowers and how many of you woke up this morning ate something for breakfast and put on clothes <laughs> <laughs> so we all raise our hands again so yes <laughs> so here's the thing no matter who you are no matter what you're doing you are changing the world every day by the clothes you wear and the food that you eat even if you never sow a single seed in your life you're changing the world always to come before us and so certainly when you save seeds you are profoundly changing that world right 10,000 years our an ago our ancestors were just hungry um, and who knows what other inspirations they had they started saving seeds Matthew is saving seeds behind me as we speak those are Rosa de Milano onions in their second year their biennials we'll get there in a minute <laughs> but as seed savers you know, could we have, could they have imagined 7,000 years ago in the Peruvian Andes that this tiny little grass that we would have simply mown would one day become corn grown on millions of acres on six of the seven continents and feed a third of the calories of 80% of the humans on this planet any given moment? <laughs> like, you have no idea as seed savers how powerfully you're changing the future of all generations of all species to come and you don't even have to sow seeds to profoundly be impacting the seeds that will always be sown on this planet every dollar you spend is actively being paid attention to by people who are plant breeders and they're specifically developing plants for those dollars in our in our current economy super extractive capitalism they're literally designing plants to extract your dollars <laughs> for you. So this is how plant breeding is being framed. And all that plant breeders do 
are save seeds with a little bit more intention. Okay, there might be a few other things, but part of my intention tonight is to bust open that myth that plant breeding is some upper echelon thing. If you have saved seeds, friends, you have, I didn't exist before my parents existed, who didn't exist before their parents. We are all unique, changing the world as the world changes us. Same is true for every plant we see. And so if you have saved seeds, next time someone asks you if you have, sa if you have developed new varieties that the world has never seen before, confidently raise your hand and say, yes, I have, because we are all plant breeders now. We'll get to that in a minute too. So yes, thank you for now knowing <laughs> that you have more power in this world than you would ever know as seeds are so deceptively small, so are you and so are us all. So I'm Petra, I'm Petra Pageman, and I grew up in my father's garden about 10 miles north in this lovely valley where I'm currently sitting. And we save seeds and I didn't think much of it. I, if you had asked little seven-year-old Petra what I'd love to do, I would have said climb mountains and read books and all kinds of things, but I would never have told you gardening. I also wouldn't have told you seed saving. I also wouldn't have told you brushing my teeth. It was just what we did. And I'm so grateful that I can take that for granted, could take that for granted as a child. My father gave me this unbelievable gift of closing loops, of seeing how these loops interact and correspond. And I will always be grateful. We saved seeds because we wanted to save some the next year. <laughs> This is really novel <laughs> thoughts for our current food system. <laughs> and yes, it is. So, and just like anything, I learned how to paint when I was four years old, and I haven't really evolved much beyond that. <laughs> and I learned how to seed, seed save about that time. I have learned a lot about it since, but I will be a student of seed saving for the rest of my days. And I hope to continue to feel that the more I know, the less I know, and the more I'm curious and so eager to be a student, even as I share and teach. So yes, let's dive in. Today, we're gonna dive into talking about at saving the seeds of annuals, of the very easiest seeds to save. And I've designed it so there's a bunch of different things that even if you didn't design your garden with this eye for seed saving specifically in mind, that you nonetheless will be able to save seeds this year, which is awesome. And first, I just wanted to read a few paragraphs from an article that I wrote um, because well, of course, every mother thinks her babies and her writing is beautiful and brilliant, but I would love to share this with you all. So this was published last winter in the Small Farmers Journal, a lovely publication, perhaps a few of you know. And it's an article called, We Are All Plant Breeders Now. They told you to order from the catalog, to plant in tilled soil, to get big or get out to dig in, to fit in, to simply follow the instructions on the packet. They promised you yields and markets, profitability, prosperity. They promised you stability and security if you would just do what you're told. They told, sold you big tractors with bigger debt and small patented seeds and a certain social grace with less than a living wage. And now we know we reap what we sow. In the last century, farmers and their communities have been uprooted from our 10,000 year legacy, the seeds themselves. As seeds have moved from commons to commodity, it is no longer common to find a farmer growing their own seed, much less involved in any breeding process. And yet we are with every bite. Let's get to work, friends. But first, let's step back. Let us remember we all come from a great lineage of farmers, of seed stewards, of plant breeders, of seed keepers. From 10,000 years to a century ago, to be a farmer was synonymous with being a seed saver, synonymous in turn with being a plant breeder. Keen observation, thoughtful selection, and an appreciation for diversity across the millennia have surrounded us with all the agricultural crops we know, we love, that we depend upon daily. 
as Joseph Lofthouse loves to remind me, everything we think of as agricultural diversity is the genius vision of 10,000 years of indigenous farmers, patient, brilliant, and illiterate by only modern standards. Countless generations and entire cultures were plant breeders before DNA was even described, and indeed, modernity has thoroughly rogued human interest from our food system. We've all heard the statistics. Over 80% of agricultural diversity we've cultivated a century ago no longer exists. It is gone extinct. The Industrial Revolution has kicked us out of our own Eden. There's good news and there's bad news. First, the good news. Even if we never sow a single seed, everything we eat becomes statistics and funds the nourish the, and nourishes the next generation of plant breeding. Every dish we prepare, every dollar we spend reinforces either industrial or human scales. And this is only bad news if we don't choose to activate, if we don't choose to nourish these human scale models. Friends, we are all plant breeders now. So let's dig in. And so the rest of the article continue, proceeds to lay out the five approaches to adaptive seed stewardship. And I'm about to share this in a blog. So, um, and I'm about to read the whole thing um, on social media as well. Shameless plug, I hang out all the time on Instagram and Facebook. So that's an awesome way to keep in touch. And we have a beautiful email list as well. I don't actually, let me back up. I don't think I shared in my like intro. Yes, I grew up in my father's garden saving seeds. I spent well over a decade um, in Oregon and in other places saving seeds in the professional seed world. And so for small seed companies, for small seed growers, I also worked for one of the biggest seed companies in the world and everything galvanized me that decentralization is essential. And so in 2012, my beloved partner, Matthew, who is harvesting onion seeds over there, <laughs> and I started Fruition Seeds. And so we saved, the seeds of hundreds and hundreds of varieties of vegetables, flowers, and herbs. Our focus is regional adaptation because I grew up thinking that we couldn't grow watermelons here in the Finger Lakes in Zone 5, and turns out we can. We just need the right seeds. Turns out they're annuals, so we'll talk about it really soon. Turns out this is a brand new variety that we're still totally developing, and I hope that you are going to help us Stay tuned, I want to tell you more about that too. Um, so yes, fruition seeds, when people ask if we have children, we say yes, and great, 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 great grandchildren. And if we, and we put them in packets. And if I think they have a sense of humor, I say, and you can eat them. And indeed, these are our children and our children's children and the beloved heirlooms of all generations of humans yet to come if we do our work well of not only saving seeds of sharing with people like you how to save seeds and not only how but why because our ancestors loved us so much that they saved and shared these seeds with us and i love you and i love thinking of all of the humans that will yet you know eat watermelon radishes and their lives will be changed. Uh, and of all the little people who will know that we can grow peanuts here in the Northeast. We can totally grow watermelon. We just need seeds well adapted and that there are people doing this. And certainly we are doing this here at Fruition Seeds, but let's dig in because I would love for you to, to be sharing and saving seeds with your friends, with your family, with your communities. And um, Doug, are there any questions that I've missed so far? Um, dive right in. Otherwise, we'll jump into the vocab. We haven't gotten any in the chat. So let's cool. Start. Awesome. Well, friends, again, don't be shy. And here's where we get into a little more of the nitty gritty. So I'm going to share um, some key vocab terms so that moving forward, we're just on the same page. And then we'll dive into the handful of seeds that are super easy to save, that you can save this year, even if you didn't design your garden with seed saving in mind. So here are a few of those vocab terms, and I'll run through them. We'll talk biennials, annuals, perennials. We'll talk about bolting, self-pollinated versus cross-pollinated, dry seed versus wet seed, how genus species plays into this, and also isolation distance 
patient's population size. Um, so yes, let's start from the top. There are annual plants. And so annuals, quick check-in, I'm sure you're all on board. They make their seeds in one year. Even, and we all kind of understand this. Even if we don't think of <laughs> knowing a watermelon's life cycle, we do. Every time we plant a watermelon seed, and then two months later, we're spitting watermelons at our brothers and sisters. <laughs> like, we've just witnessed the entirety of a watermelon's life cycle. So they just, annuals go to seed in, on an annual cycle. Biennials, two years. So just like those onions behind me, um, these are lovely zinnias, of course, but behind them you can perhaps see all those lovely orbs of onion flowers. So where's the flower in an onion? A biennial second year they go to seed. So hopefully we'll be able to dig into biennials someday and soon. And then perennials, of course, go to seed every year and they come back year after year. So let's talk about annuals because they are hands down, especially here in the Northeast, the easiest seeds to save because you don't have to overwinter them. So next we have, let's just talk about bolting. So something like cilantro, for example, um, is an annual. And when they, you know, they have those lovely wide leaves like we have on our packet, so delicious. And as they start to bolt, their leaves get more feathery and then they and so that bolting is them that referring to the seed stock rising and flowering and you can see here yes they are dry seeded which goes into one of our other vocab terms you can see that lovely green seed is exposed to all of the elements that is a dry seed and it's green yet, so you'll want to wait until that green seed is gold. For example, we have some dill here, which still is so heavenly to smell. And yes, once that seed is nice and beautifully golden and dry, it's important to harvest them. And just in terms of us being here in the Northeast, it's vital that as soon as the seed is dry and gold, that we be harvesting it. Most seed production has moved out west and to the arid parts of our country, of the planet, because it's way more economical to grow seed in arid climates because you can just let these seeds sit on the umbels and it literally, when I lived in Oregon, it didn't rain from the middle of June till sometimes the end of September. It didn't rain once. So there's, it's very, very <laughs> arid. Then even if it's not raining here in the Northeast, it's humid often, right? So that humidity, it doesn't even have to rain. Just the dew, the humidity, water is the primary vector for every disease on the planet. <laughs> so yes, disease is a really significant thing. So all of your dry seeded crops here in the Northeast, you want to be sure that you are harvesting them promptly. And even if there's something like a bean or this beautiful nigella housed in a pod, if it's papery, um, or here you know, is a lovely arugula stalk, um, it's in a pod and that is still considered a dry seed because they readily dehiss and open up where as opposed to the, a wet seed, which is housed inside a wet, fruit, of course. And now let's talk um, self versus cross. Um, and a little follow up on the wet seeded ones. You don't need to worry as much about um, when you harvest wet seeded crops. If it's a tomato, you just want to harvest it when you eat it because as we'll talk about soon, a tomato that is fully ripe for the eating it has fully ripe glorious seed inside so you might as well just harvest it when it's ripe but something like a winter squash for example you can just let it sit on the vine cure the longer it cures the greater vigor that it has um, for the first eight weeks after you have it harvested so yes now let's talk self and cross-pollinated. So a self-pollinated plant has a flower. Um, generally, they're perfect in ridiculous botany terms, which I can't wait to redefine because what is perfection? Um, but they have both the male and female mechanisms of reproduction within that flower. And so they very easily pollinate themselves. And in, some, in that case, something like a bean or a pea 
it literally, this bean was literally pollinated before the flower even opened. Isn't that amazing? And so beans, peas, peanuts, the flowers are literally vestigial organs. <laughs> and so you don't need any isolation size, any isolation distance or population size, as we'll talk about in a few minutes. But there's a spectrum, right? It's not just a binary of your self-pollinated or your cross. You're either like, here's a bean, profoundly on the cross pollen on the on the self-pollinated spectrum it pollinated before the flower even opened no bee had a chance <laughs> and then there's tomatoes which about 10 feet is what i recommend for just you know home seed, seed saving um, between crossing for us we we do 50 feet because we just like to sleep at night and something like this watermelon literally has male and female flowers on separate on separate flowers on the same plant. Something like spinach has separate male and female plants entirely. It's true. You, when you're eating spinach, you're, you could think about it like eating a little boy or little girl. Little girl. They're literally different sexes on different plants. Um, but this watermelon, the more, the more something is on the spectrum of cross-pollination, the more it needs isolation distance. So this watermelon crosses with every other watermelon up to a mile. And that's true for zucchini too, which is crazy because zucchini, and this is where we get into genus species, because genus species, it's imperative as seed savers that we know the genus species of what we're saving the seed of. I guess it's not imperative, but you might be surprised. Only You'd only be surprised if you have a... <laughs> pumpkin zucchini or an acorn delicata zucchini next year if you didn't realize that oh they all share the same genus species so in the same way that dogs are all the same genus species and can cross and do <laughs> that is true for cucurbita pipo is zucchini is all patty pan summer squash as well as spaghetti squash and acorn delicata squash dumplings <laughs> isn't that amazing pumpkins so yes cucurbita pipo also brassica oleraceae is kale and collards and broccoli and cabbage and brussels sprouts and 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 all of these things which is all just to say our ancestors were amazing that they took this same common wild plant, the ancestor of all of those things, and selected all of that diversity from that one common ancestor. Amazing. So yes, there's uh, so genus species is impressively important, and you'll find generally seed packets share all of that info um, on their on their. Um, website, on their seed packets, on ours, um, you know, you'll find it right there on the back of all of our packets. So that is really fun, just dorky information to see how everything interrelates as well, um, but is really important for seed saving. So I mentioned before, and let me share a little bit more about isolation distance as well as population size. So isolation distance, corn can cross up to 37 miles. <laughs> I mean, it's been proven to cross 37 miles um, in the hills of Mexico. So those very fine pollen grains that are just like designed for millions of years to waft across great expanses of, of air, it's really important that we, if we want to actually keep them separated from each other and keep them genetically pure from each other, we can isolate both in distance as well as time. So generally we have five different farms here at Fruition Seeds and that's so we can manage our isolation distances. So we can grow a pumpkin over here and a zucchini over there and the spaghetti squash over there and sleep at night that they're not all getting crossed up. So that also we are surrounded as if you live here in the northeast in new england you certainly have lots of gm corn all around you as well genetically modified corn and certainly we do here in western new york in these beautiful finger lakes and so there's literally not really a good way that we could i mean 37 miles distant from any other corn impossible um, so we isolate by time and we also hand pollinate a lot which um, nofa mass actually just shared i just shared a whole um really wonderful webinar with them on hand pollinating squash and cucurbits so if you're interested in that definitely check it out 
But in the meantime, know that, yeah, like that isolation distance as well as time are really important so that you can feel confident that you're saving your zucchini seed and it's actually going to grow zucchini for you next year. And there's also this briefly get touching on population size. Population size is especially important for those outcrossing, for those cross-pollinated species. Something like corn, if you have less than 200 plants that are going to seed, plants experience inbreeding depression just like humans can. And so if you have too small a population size, the recessive traits just build up and build up and build up and start to express themselves in really problematic ways. So as a general rule, outcrossing plants and cross-pollinated plants need much larger population sizes like onions, those onions behind me. We needed at least 200 onions to be sure that year after year, we are saving robust, vigorous, incredibly diverse, happy, healthy populations of those onions. Which, so a lot of these annuals that I'm about to share with you with a few exceptions, but most of them, they're self-pollinated or they are so vigorous and diverse already um, in their cross-pollination that you really don't have to worry about population size. So that makes it easy and awesome. So the final piece before I jump into the specific varieties, the crop types that I want to be sharing with you of how to save seed of, I just wanna share this notion that seed saving, I cringe to say seed saving, I like to call it seed selection because yes, I'm saving and sharing the seed, but really I'm selecting the seed. And even if you're not intentionally making selections, you're still selecting for the ones that somehow survived. <laughs> so and that's, you know, survival of the fittest is natural selection. And so we're very deeply participating in this as seed savers, as plant breeders. Um, and so take a look. I'd love to share with you some of these lovely little cosmos. So our friends Brian and Christine of Uprising Seeds, a glorious seed company in Bellingham, Washington, they shared with us these wonderful cosmos seeds that are bright tangerine orange years and years and years and years ago. And we shared some seed um, with our friends Dee Dee and Dan years and years and years ago. And then a few years ago, I was, we were sharing supper with them out on their back porch and they have this wonderful garden down below. And I was looking down, there was this glorious yellow flower swaying in the breeze. I said, guys, what is that beautiful yellow flower? And they looked at me like I had three heads and they said, you don't even recognize your grandchildren, do you? And I said, what? And because the diversity within that seeds, the seeds that Brian and Christine had shared with this orange had within it this lovely yellow flower. And Dee Dee and Dan just happened to like the yellow better than the orange. And so they selected for that yellow and as we so now we have separate populations and I've just noticed that look at this can you see the bicolor on those petals so now we're isolating and selecting for these bicolors just amazing and so yes we could just save all of these seeds and that is totally wonderful we can also select and separate them and make individual populations or just make sure that we're saving and selecting them to maintain whatever level of diversity brings us joy. And those selections, those joys are such a socioeconomic, political, they're such a cultural equation, right? There's nothing that makes them better or qualities that make them better. So things that we save eggplants for are very different than they do in Sicily, which is very Italy, which is very different than how they select eggplants <laughs> in, in India, for example. So there's no right and there's no wrong, which is a whole other subject, which is all to say that just be clear about what you're saving seeds for. At Fruition Seeds, we're selecting for flavor first and foremost, because otherwise, what's the point? Um, and certainly in terms of flowers, it's just the beauty that brings us joy. But also it's early maturity because otherwise it doesn't matter even if it's delicious, if it doesn't mature early enough in our climate, I won't be eating watermelon. 
<laughs> and I want to be eating watermelon every day in August. Thank you. This variety, this new variety that we developed, this was literally, this variety was ripe three weeks ago in mid-July. It was crazy. So yes, we are, this is the power of seed selection. Also diversity, pardon me, disease resistance um, and diversity too, but disease resistance because how many of you have tomatoes that get late blight <laughs> and it's annoying and early blight and septoria leaf spot. And so we're selecting varieties that are resistant to those things as well as early, as well as delicious because we want to have our cake and eat it too. So, um, and also just productivity. There's all of these different factors um, that we select seeds for. And so, yes, when you're saving seeds, you're not just saving seeds, you are selecting seeds, friends. So have fun. And the more intentional you are in it, the more profound and bigger leaps you can make in it. So without further ado, I would love to share the crops and I'll just run through them um, as the laundry list and then we'll go through crop by crop and most sincerely, I'm woefully capable of monologues and if you have any questions, don't be shy. I would love to hear all of your thoughts and quandaries. So yeah, I'm going to share a little bit more about beans, peas and peanuts super easy to share. Also, dill and cilantro, super easy to save the seed of. Um, lettuce and arugula, also insanely easy to save the seed of, um, and I hope that you do. And as well as a lot of flowers, like these zinnias, like sunflowers, like cosmos, um, calendula, so many annual flowers that you can save seed of. And of tomato, of course, um, it's so fun to save tomato seeds and so easy. And then of course, garlic as well. Um, this is one of our elephant garlics that we've been um, selecting so that I always, you know, right along, right there with watermelons and peanuts, which I grew when I was little and they didn't grow well. So I thought it's just too short a season. Turns out it's just our lack of human imagination because diversity is the foundation of resilience. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> so you just have to find the most gen diverse genetics you can find and you'll probably find the trait that you're looking for. Whether it's cold hardiness in elephant garlic, earliness in watermelons, or the fact that you can save, a, you can grow a tomato in San Diego and ship it to Bangor, Maine and in February and it will work. So yes, all of those things, whether it's industrial scales or human scales, all of these things are possible within the genomes of the plants that we're working with. So we might as well know it and select for it. Um, so uh, did I see a question, Doug? Yeah, Jen asked a question. Um, some plants that don't seem to easily bolt or fruit like beets, carrots, and kale, um, under how and what conditions do these plants go to seed? Jen's Great questions, and Jen. So those are biennials. So those go to seed in their second year. So we'll need to store them over the winter um, and then plant them out the second year. So those onions behind me, you know, of course there's zinnias, but the orbs of the onions behind me, those are um, roots, like the onions themselves were grown last year in 2019 and stored in our root cellar all winter. We planted them out here in our high tunnel um, in late in late March. And so we they need to go through a, a vernalization period. It's like my, my dear friend and mentor, uh, Don Tipping, calls it putting the fear of God in these vegetables. Like they're just growing, they're just growing, they're just growing. But, and they're not going to go to seed unless they have that vernalization, that cold period, that winter to kind of be like, oh yeah, life isn't just roses. And now that it's warm again, how about I make seed? <laughs> Was there a little follow-up question there? Yeah, Laura asked, why do some beets and, and chard go to seed in their first year? <gasps> that is poor selection, my friends. Mm -hmm. So that is literally, that's literally a seed companies um, circumventing their life cycle so that it becomes a more economic commodity product mm -hmm. for them rather than saving high quality seed that is not going to bolt. So yes, because seed is now such a commodity and 
and seed growers aren't being paid for selections. They're just paid by volume for quantity, not quality, right? So they're getting, it, there's no, um, and same with parsley. Yeah, that is just, that is totally an issue with the seed, with the seed community, with the seed companies, not vernal, encouraging their growers to take shortcuts um, and not paying them for doing good seed stewardship. It's really painful. So yeah, let your seed companies know um, so that they can be more attentive and do greater selections because they're just saving seed and they're saving all the seed because they're only getting paid by volume. They're not getting paid by selections. And so it's this self-fulfilling prophecy where the seed grower has to make a living and they're making not a lot of money. Um, it's really depressing. Um, and so, you know, the middlemen, the distributors are where um, the, the money is being made. So they're calling the shots. So yeah, that's a whole other subject. Let's talk about seed politics <laughs> for the rest of our lives. Um, but yeah, so here we want to, I want to share with you the annuals that you can save seed of. Because certainly if you have beets going to seed, parsley shard, do not save that seed unless you fertilize them. And check out our YouTube channel. We have a bunch of awesome videos about that. Um, also just on our website um, and fruitionseeds.com, you'll find seed saving as well as growing information um, so that you can be surrounded by abundance. And so can all of your children and children's children's children for generations to come. Um, so yeah, I'd love to jump into those particular crop types and maybe let's do a time check, Doug, and see if we can go through, I can go through from the top down, but if anyone is like, I really want to talk about tomatoes or let's dial in arugula, let's, we can just jump to those as well. Yeah, we haven't had any specific requests. It's 540, so we still have, um, almost an hour Cool, great. So yeah, let's dive into peas and beans and peanuts. So as I shared earlier, all of those are you know, annuals. So we plant them one season, save seed all in that same season. And they are self-pollinated, beans, peas, peanuts, amazing crazy facts of the world. They literally self-pollinate before the flower even opens. So what that means among other things is that if I am a bean here in this hand and another bean in this hand and they're six inches away from each other and flowering adjacent, they will not cross. And so the isolation distance with peas and beans <laughs> technically like professionally it's 10 feet which is mostly just to prevent mechanical mixing of the seeds right because there's no way that they're actually going to cross the, the flowers themselves and so yes it's really so that's why it's so easy and you don't need to worry about population sizes with beans also so it's kind of a fun little like baby wormhole i'll go down here for just a moment because i love i love thinking about why things happen and not just like oh this happens i love digging into the like deeper especially like ecological psych of like plant psycho psyche psychological reasons why it exists so beans have been have gone through a lot of different bottlenecks over the years like across the millennia millions of years millions of years so they've gone through all of these bottlenecks where their populations were super small and so they had to find ways of developing inherent resilience i.e genetic diversity within the context of very limited genetic diversity. And so even though they're expressing themselves very um, uniformly, how, how many of you have grown scarlet runner beans? And how many of you, if you've saved scarlet runner beans, if you've saved those seeds, and if you saved more than 20 pods, you've probably seen that you get some bright, instead of those beautiful purple and black seeds and stripes on the, on the seeds, um, all you get like jet black, brilliant, glossy ebony seeds. And so they really regularly are throwing sports. So those like random mutations um, so that they're developing an intrinsic diversity. So yes, a lot of these self-pollinated crops have gone through dramatic bottlenecks of very and survived very limited population sizes in the past. And that's why 
they figured out how to maintain genetic diversity without needing pollen to cross and insects and wind to cross that pollen. So yes, beans and peas, super easy. You want to let them go past their delicious stage. Um, so, you know, this bean, as you can see, is well on its way. It's a few days past its prime edibility. It's starting to show some swelling there. And take a look. It's a little early for beans to be maturing on our farm. But I realized that on this seed packet, which this is our chocolate runner bean, can you see how that pod is gold? So you want to let the pod go from green to golden brown. And just like with this dill and other dry seeded crops, you want to, as soon as you see that pod turn gold, be harvesting it. Because with all the humidity here in the Northeast, they so easily just accumulate all kinds of diseases, molds, rotting. And so it's important that you be um, harvesting them promptly. And another facet with this is, yeah, an, just some fun little fact, bean flowers are delicious. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, if you eat the flower, then you don't get to eat the bean. But at the end of the season, if they're still flowering and they're not going to make bean, um, like big, beautiful beans for you to eat, um, don't hesitate, put them in salads. They're really sweet, they're really luscious. So yes, um, another facet, so these chocolate runner beans, they're a different, all other, like the classic bush beans and, and just classic string beans are phaseolus vulgaris genus species. But take a look, runner beans are Phaseolus coccinius. And so they don't cross with any of the others, but they do, again, since self and cross pollination is on a spectrum rather than a binary switch up and down, yes or no, runner beans will cross up to 10, 20 feet. So it's a little, there aren't exact numbers. We are on the side of 50, just so we, again, love to sleep at night. Um, but know that if you're growing scarlet and chocolate runner beans, you could be growing an awesome cross of those things. And I hope that you do, because who knows what's going to happen next? And it could be awesomely delicious, not to mention beautiful. Um, so yes, they're there's a fun little notion. So peas, same thing. You want to let those, those peas, that outer shell become totally brown and dry. And you want those seeds to become like little solid rocks. If you can still squish them a little bit, they're not quite ripe yet. And we love to harvest those pods and then put them in a dry place, preferably out of direct sunlight with lots of airflow, i.e. we have just fans blowing on them constantly so they can continue to dry down and be as dry and crisp as possible. Um, so peanuts, I also wanted to mention because, you know, they're kind of in that pea, bean, peanut, that leguminous, marvelous family. And yeah, you just let those grow the entire season. And then at the end of the season, after frost, they will die. And that's when you dig them up with a fork and you've got all these peanuts that are, of course, delicious, but you can also easily save seed of them as well. And I wanted to mention, I grew up as I mentioned in my father's garden. And when I was seven, we grew a handful of peanuts and I was so excited. And at the end of the season, we harvested them and there were literally as many people, like we planted five peanuts, I harvested seven. It was so amazingly disappointing. And I am <laughs> not a practical person in any way really. And even as a little tiny impractical seven-year-old Petra, I was like, dad, that was a waste of garden space. Because <laughs> you bled them after frost, right? So for us, it's like end of May, beginning of June. And so you're, you're sitting there until late September, early October. And I'm like, wow, seven peanuts. Never going to do that again. So then in the infinite fates of the world, um, this fellow reaches out to us at uh, when we, when Matthew and I started Fruition Seeds and shared that he had a Northern Hardy Valencia peanut. And I said, well, isn't that fascinating? I would love to try some because I'm a very nice person and I try not to be rude. <laughs> and in my head, I was like, oh my 
gosh, this poor man. How, what? Wow. Okay. Well, as a bird in the hand, we'll give it a try. But I was like, wow, I can't, what's going, I can't believe I'm actually growing peanuts again. And joke is on me. So we planted them, you know, at, at the end of last frost, um, just like our beans and our and we grew them and they're so much fun because they flower and then they send down these purple peduncles these purple stalks that literally they flower on the pretend my hand is a stalk they're flowering here way, way down deep in you can totally miss them they're not big showy flowers so they send when they pollinate they send down a purple stalk a, called a peduncle down into the ground and when that peduncle hits the ground that's where it forms the peanut and so at the end of the season you have all these peduncles trailing down like buttresses on cathedrals and you dig up and it's like all these peanuts and so that first year we grew them a groundhog moved in to that bed in the beginning of September and I was like wow if there were any chances of there being peanuts now surely there is zero <laughs> so lo and behold frost comes and lo and behold we dig them up and lo and behold there were a oh, well over 20 peanuts per plant and it had been a fairly cold season and I was just blown away so moral many morals of many stories but generally chipmunks squirrels groundhogs they don't like to eat crude protein they need it to be cooked just like we do to digest it well so it's very rare it has totally happened um, but it's very rare that your peanuts will be eaten before you harvest them which is the great news and also, wow, you can totally regionally adapt. So then I was just blown away. I was like, what? How did you do this? And for over 40 years, this man in the upper peninsula of Michigan single-handedly was just saving seeds, except he wasn't saving seeds of this peanut. He was selecting them, right? He was selecting those pods that had four and five peanuts per shell. He was select saving them only from plants that had the most peanuts per plant. And then he was eating the rest. So he single-handedly made this incredible variety that's really well adapted, which I just share to say, yes, seed saving is seed selecting and seed selecting is I mean, it's plant breeding. He had created a variety that was, is unlike any other variety that exists on the planet. And he didn't have a degree in anything relating to horticulture, genetics. Neither do I. Fun facts, I don't have a degree at all. <laughs> you know? So yes, don't be, don't, and if you had told me a decade ago that I would ever consider myself a plant breeder, I would have said, I don't think so. That sounds A, like someone really intelligent, B, like someone with a lot of resources and experience and probably a degree, a background in genetics. And this just in, our ancestors for 10,000 plus years understood that keen observation is the currency of education. We're not taught that in school generally these days. Well, I wouldn't know since I didn't go to school. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I did audit two semesters at Cornell <laughs> of graduate genetic studies. And I was like, oh, what? You want me to pay you and to learn about GMOs? I don't think so. I digress. So, <laughs> which is all to say, you don't need anything fancy. You just need friends. You're welcome. I'm so glad we met. Don't be shy. My email's Petra page, Petra at fruitionseeds.com. Like, let's talk about this. This is community. Uh, seed saving is only something that has been saved for the professionals for the last century. And it's part of how our industrial food system has thoroughly estranged humans from it. So I digress. So yeah, let's be in touch. Let's talk anytime. Seed saving, plant breeding, gardening, anything. You want to talk about banjos? Let's talk about banjos. Okay. So now let's talk about dill and cilantro because how many of you have dill and cilantro? Oh yeah. What's that? When you're harvesting, you know, peas and beans, are you letting them dry in the hull or are you hauling them and letting them dry? Yes. Save them in the pod. So essentially this pod is kind of the placenta and like the womb and I mean the mother. So there's literally, and we'll open it up. There's literally this little tiny primordial bean 
is connected to the pod, right? That's the umbilical cord, the equivalent of. So it's getting all of its energy from the plant. This bean, it's green. It's literally full of, photosynth of chlorophyll photosynthesizing. So it's, yes, getting energy from the leaves, but from the bean itself and from the pod itself. And so, yes, you want to leverage every bit of those delicious sugars <laughs> <laughs> that this plant is photosynthesizing straight into the bean. You can harvest it a little under ripe with a little bit of greenness if the plant is just like dying from some other disease or something and or like it just gets weeded out by mistake and they'll and they'll they will continue to mature. If there's enough of the like seed that's matured already, it will continue. It just won't have the same vigor, which is all to say yes make sure that you are saving that bean, whether it's seeds in the bean, leaving them in the pod, or all of this lovely arugula, like leave it in the, in the plant as long as possible. And that way it will confer all of that delicious nutrition from the plant that will ultimately be the foundation of its resilience, of its vigor in future generations. Yeah, any other questions about beans, peas, peanuts? Fabulous. The next question Ooh. is, yeah. and you might touch on this, is if there's a special way to cure uh, wet seeds, but you might touch on that. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, let's, um, let's hold off and we'll jump into um, we can do tomatoes next. I was going to do cilantro and dill, um, but does anyone have a preference? Should I have a little shout out in the uh, shout out in the chat? Do you want to do beans and and or do you want to do um, cilantro or do we want to do dill and cilantro first? Laura, you're first to share, so you get it. <laughs> Early bird gets the cilantro dill. <laughs> so yeah, if you're anything like me, your cilantro and dill goes to seed way too fast. Right? It bolts really quickly, and that's another symptom of our seed system where you're not if you're noticing that dill and uh, pardon me swiss chard that parsley is germinating pardon me bolting in its first year as a biennial that's just a symptom of a commodification extractive seed system so same is true with that dill and cilantro seed growers aren't being paid enough to do any selection work so they're not so it's continuing to bolt faster and faster. And so as you, as a seed saver, as fruition seeds, the first 20% of these crops that bolt, we just, we eat and or send to our chickens. We don't save the seed of it. So that we're every generation making sure that we're selecting against early bolting. But as honestly, this is where home scale, this is where you have so much power because you can say, 20%. Come on, Petra. I'm going to do 95%. I only need a couple plants to go to seed because a couple plants will have all of these umbels and more, and that's a ton of seed. <laughs> and so you can afford to eat all of that cilantro and dill, all of that dill that is bolting first so that you're only saving seed of the seeds that are bolting last. Because if you, so many people are like, yes, my, my dill, my cilantro, it just reseeds itself. It's awesome. And that is awesome. But here's the thing. If you're not doing any intentional selection, you're unintentionally selecting for dill and cilantro that's going to seed earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier. So it's not in that lovely kind of vegetative leaf stage as early as it, as long as it possibly can. And so the same is true for lettuce. The same is true for arugula. If you want lettuce that doesn't bolt as fast, just select against lettuce that's bolting first. <laughs> the first 20% of all of our lettuce that bolts, we also um, eat first. So here's the little, you can also tell. Oh, and I wish I had. So I mentioned earlier the cilantro. When it is fully luscious in its vegetative state, its leaves are wide. And as it begins to get taller, you'll notice just before it gets taller, it starts sending out those more feathery leaves. And those are still delicious. They're starting to get more complex, a little more mineral, bitter flavor, because 
seeds, plants generally, when they're going to seed, just have all of these different suite of compounds and different nutrients being sent to different places so that they're, you know, enzymatically transitioning to make seed. So lettuce, right before it bolts, lettuce is really glossy in its vegetative state. Before it bolts, it turns matte, kind of dull. And so it's like two, three days before it sends up its seed stock, you know that it's gonna transition. So we're keeping an eye for all of our glossy lettuce turning dull and we just eat those. So then we're not like, we can have our lettuce and save our seed too. Um, so yeah, with that dill and cilantro, the final thing that I'll mention there is just, yeah, making sure, as I've mentioned earlier, just as soon as it's dry brown gold, that the seeds effortlessly just fall off with your hand pulling that on them slightly, that means the seed is ripe and ready. And continue to dry it for a few days on screens with fans. And at a large scale, they we do all kinds of things and then we have to clean them really well. But if you don't want to mess around with cleaning them much, you can just simply take those seeds from each umbel and lift them off carefully. And then you won't be bringing all this chaff along with your seeds. So yeah, a few keys to keep in mind with dill and cilantro, but namely just select. And also with, with cilantro, ours overwinters uncovered in our field. Cilantro is incredibly cold hardy, which I didn't realize um, when I was a, a small child. And so we just planted it in summer and we were always having to succession sow it because it was always bolting. But in the cool seasons, we actually plant it first thing in spring. We also plant it in fall, like your September sown cilantro will often overwinter. And then you can eat it through the winter. You can also eat it in, as it regrows in the spring. And so, yeah, that's another thing that we select for, um, that like overwintering cilantro. And that's true for kale. We have lettuce that overwinters. So yeah, because we're here in zone five and we love to eat, we kind of go to town on that winter hardiness um, because it's how we take care of ourselves and take care of each other. Um, so yeah, there's, so I mentioned with that lettuce and arugula too, similar to the dill cilantro, you want to be selecting for the early, uh, against the early bolting in those crops, which by contrast, let's dive into our tomatoes now. You want to be select, you don't want to select against early fruiting, early seed set. You want to be selecting for those or first seeds that go to seed, those first seeds that put tomatoes out early. So it's kind of the opposite psychology, which is really fun. And tomatoes, um, so take a peek, and you've probably seen the tomato seeds. Every single one is surrounded pardon, by a membrane, by a clear gelatinous membrane. And go ahead. If you can't quite see, I don't blame you, <laughs> but open up a tomato and you've probably noticed, but if you haven't, just open up a tomato and take a look at that seed and you'll see that it's not just a seed. It is covered in that gelatinous membrane. And that membrane is surrounding the seed with anti-germination compounds. So lots of compounds to prevent the seed from sprouting prematurely. Because, I mean, step back for just a moment, what are the conditions that seeds need to germinate? And generally it's, you know, warm and wet and indirect sunlight. And that's kind of what living in a tomato is like. So it's this genius, this absolutely brilliant evolutionary strategy that tomatoes and also cucumbers have just each gone to town in this. So you need to, you can just simply scrape out that seed and save, dry it, save it, and you'll get maybe 30, 40% germination. But if you ferment that seed and ferment off that coating and disable all of those anti-germination compounds, suddenly you'll easily get 98, 90%. We honestly, most of our tomatoes germ at 99, sometimes at 100%. Um, and it's from the fermentation. So to ferment, you'll want to, you know, just, it's great because you can have your cake and eat it too. You can have your tomato and save its seed too. So I would simply, take this and I, you know, we have great big <laughs> totes, huge containers full of 
<laughs> rotting tomatoes <laughs> and pulp and seeds. But at home, you can simply just take a jar. I like the jar myself because you're about, I'm so sorry I didn't think of doing this a few days ago for you because it's so fun to see in person. Um, but you'll want to see in it. I highly recommend a transparent vessel of some kind. And then simply squeeze all the seeds out. And if there's some pulp, that's totally fine. It's going to float to the top as you'll see. Um, but yeah, squeeze all the seeds and then you've got fruit you can eat and squeeze all of the seeds out. And then whatever volume you have of seeds and pulp, add that much water again and then cover it. So fruit flies are about to be delighted that you're saving seeds of tomatoes. And you don't necessarily want to encourage them, at least if you're anything like us in our house. So whether it's at the top of it, we often just put like a linen napkin with a rubber band over it or something so that you're covering it up and then just wait. Alchemy is happening before your eyes. In the higher temperatures, the fermentation happens faster. So generally it's about three days for us in the height of summer. So leave it on your kitchen counter so you can just keep an eye on it. And you'll see that initially it's all very homogenous. There's just pulp and seeds and water and it's all just a jumble. As it begins to ferment, you'll see three distinct layers forming. So there's a distinct layer of seeds on the bottom. There's a distinct layer at the top of like ferment of the, of the like, pulp, any immature seeds that are light have risen to the top as well. And then there's this whole section in the middle that's just a clear liquid that's kind of the pale pink or pale orange, whatever color of the tomato it is, um, that is just clear. It's clearly separating. So as soon as you have that striation, where you have clearly the layer of seed, the layer of water, the layer of immature seed and pulp at the top, once you have those three layers, then you know, okay, that is enough of that. <laughs> and you have beautifully fermented tomato seeds. And then add more water, and then you'll be able to just pour off the top. And so we have a whole blog about this. Check out our YouTube and also our um, website where you, I take you through step by step. Um, so you'll just add more water and pour off all of that light immature pulp and seed and so pouring it off so then and all the extra liquid and add water again and swirl it around the heavy dense mature seed will stay at the bottom and you can just keep adding more clean water pouring it off leaving the seed um, just pouring it off until that seed is about to fall out and then you'll once your water changing what the water once it's running clear then you can be confident that you have beautiful seed that has that anti-germination compound layer fermented off and then put it on screens with fans to dry um, and also be labeling at every step in the game right because right now i know that this is italian heirloom a glorious tomato and i know that this is lemon ice also a glorious tomato very distinctly different tomatoes. <laughs> as soon as I put them in a jar to ferment, they're a little more anonymous. And granted, this will have yellow pulp and water. This will have red. So I've got some clues. But suddenly, if I am doing this gardener's sweetheart tomato at the same time, they're both going to be red. And so just put a label on your jar, put a label on your seeds as they dry. I can't tell you how many tens of thousands hundreds of thousands? I don't know. It's more than I care to count. Seeds that I personally have made anonymous in my life by lackadaisically labeling them. Um, so just be sure, or not labeling them as the case may be, and is slash was. And another thought too on just before we even get to this fermentation stage, you want to be saving seed from plants that are healthy. So you also want to be saving seeds from plants that you love and also fruits that you love. Like a lot of, you can totally select against cracking. If you don't want your tomatoes to crack, it, there are varieties of course that uh, some cracked more than others, but you can select against that. Also something like this Paul Robeson, Here's one that is cat facing, and I wish there was a different, we need to come up with a different term for this. You can also select away from that, which you'll see in a lot of heirloom varieties too. So if you don't mind it, 
great. And if you're, if you do mind it, you can just select against that. Don't feel like you have to save the seed, just save the seed of the ones you want. Um, so yeah. And you want to, with tomatoes, if you ideally they have 10 feet in between different varieties to be totally confident they won't cross. But honestly, we do 50 feet just because we're a seed company, right? And if I'm putting this lovely seed in a lovely packet for you, I want to be darn sure that it's not all our radishes crossed up together and a mishmash. So I want to be really confident that when I'm sharing this gardener's sweetheart luscious cherry tomato with you, that it is exactly that. But chances are that they haven't they're self-pollinated so chances are they haven't pollinated so it's and it's at a home scale especially if you don't mind the experiment of seeing what actually happens there's really no reason to not save seeds if you have a little less space in between um i saw there was a question doug what do we have jen was heading out to take care uh, of the main farm closing up Just we love you jen and, well, that's awesome. I, it's amazing that anyone makes time to do anything in community these days, especially on Zoom when we're all so over it. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that's totally awesome. Um, so yeah, any other, any other questions about tomatoes, friends? Mm -mm -mm. And yeah, if you have any other questions, you can definitely just reach out to me anytime at Petra at fruition um, And I wanted to mention too, like with these flowers too, flowers are also super easy to save seed of. They're annuals. And you know, the hardest thing about not picking about saving flower seed is not picking them and making bouquets out of them. So, <laughs> but other than that, know that you know every variety of zinnia is going to cross with every other variety of zinnia the flowers isolation distance is a lot more nebulous a lot of the companies doing seed saving at like serious industrial scales are not sharing that information publicly which is really fascinating i just assume that it's a lot um i.e like a mile in between is ideal optimal um so yes but have fun let all your zinnias cross see what happens next so yeah this is the cosmos um these lovely beautiful um diablos now wielding in the sun and you'll see you know they're often they're all dry seeded by and large and they start to send out this is this cosmos and they all look unique which is one of the things that I love about seeds and seed saving. Um, but you can start to see the seeds, they're still green, they're still photosynthesizing, they're still developing, maturing. And on the way over, when they're ripe, fully ripe, they just kind of fall off the plant. And so with this, even bringing them over, perhaps you can see um, three quarters of them just fell off the plant. Often when I harvest them, I'm literally just holding them like this so they fall off into my hand because I love it they like splay out like fireworks and so yeah making sure that you're harvesting on a nice warm dry day that's nice and breezy so that seed is totally dry is really important and again like if when I lived in Oregon we would just let the dry seeds just pile up on the plants all season long but here in the northeast we're actually growing these flowers under our high tunnel so we can grow them all season long and not have to constantly be harvesting them um, but if you're growing them in your field in your garden it's really important that you be harvesting them promptly as soon as you see that they're ripe and mature so that they'll be the highest quality um, for seasons to come so yeah, flowers are super easy to save. I did want to mention though, that sunflowers are deceptively easy to save. We have a whole blog about this, check it out. So sunflowers, you want to harvest them, of course, when, you know, the goldfinches are starting to go to town. Um, but here's the thing, there's an even smaller invertebrate that also likes to eat them. There's this little sunflower weevil, and if you've saved your own sunflower seeds, you've probably seen, if you've taken a close look, that out that there's a tiny little hole in that 
there can be lots of a tiny little hole emerging from a sunflower seed in the spring and that it won't germinate. So that sunflower weevil is brilliant. It literally lays its eggs in the developing flower. And so the seed head, the pericarp, the shell, the outer hull of that sunflower is forming around the seed, also around that insect egg. Isn't that outrageously mind-blowingly brilliant? But also devastating because that's what you're literally, you can't select away from, like it's just in the seed. Um, so then it's going, they're going to, you know, eventually emerge and then eat your seed and then burrow out and fly away. So to circumvent that, you can freeze them. So once you dry, harvest your sunflower seed heads, and, and this is Will Bonsall's stand fast. So it's a great big seed, great big heads, all confectionery for snacking all day long. And they're huge, amazing seeds. And we just love Will so much. And he, so we harvest those seeds, dry them fully, because if they're not dry and you freeze seeds, that water, right? When water expands, it becomes ice. It becomes, imagine a snowflake. It becomes all of those tiny little daggers that slash cell walls, which is why that first frost just lays waste to your basil. It just has zero resistance to that temperature shift. And so, but if seeds, if they're low enough moisture, like less than less than 12%, ideally less than 8%, then there's no, you can freeze them and there's not enough moisture to be damaging cell walls. So that's where harvesting them promptly, drying them fully, and then we put them in plastic bags, throw them in the freezer. Um, three days later, we're like, okay, great. You've effectively killed that little weevil. And so even though that weevil egg is still present with that seed, it has died. And so um, that's a great way. Otherwise, you know, it's really easy to save sunflower seed, but then you have very low sunflower seed germination um, as a result of the German of the sunflower weevil. So yes, fun facts. I often will also put in desiccation packs when you're drying seeds. Um, you know, and you'll find desiccation like silica packets in nori, you know, um, in shoes, in vitamins, right? These little silica packets that say do not eat and don't eat them, but do save them and put them in with your seed collection and they'll wick away moisture. We also have great big industrial ones that we share on our website because, you know, we, uh, put them in all our seed and they're really helpful to have when you have lots of seeds. So um, we love to share those as well. But we, when we are saving our sunflower seeds before we freeze them, we'll put them, we'll dry them as well as we possibly can. And then I wish you could see the hummingbird. Oh my gosh, maybe you can. That is a, oh, I think it's just off camera on these sunflowers. I mean, Zinnia. Um, but before you're freezing that, that sunflower seed, put them in a plastic bag, seal the bag, put a desiccant packet or two if there are big ones or like a dozen of them if they're the small ones. And then for three days, let it just sit. So even if that, those desiccant packets will continue to wick any extra moisture so that you can be totally confident that the seeds that you're freezing um, are, have low enough moisture that they won't be negatively impacted by the freezing. Um, yeah, Are you testing so, your um, seed moisture content? You how do we test? Eight, seven percent. Yeah, so it's easy with things like, um, imagine a cucumber or a winter squash. You can literally just take them between your fingers and there's the bend, not bend versus break rule. So if it bends, if those seeds bend, they are totally moist, way over 8%, way over 12%. Um, so if it bends, no, no, we need it to break. 
And so keep drying all of those larger seeds. You can also take smaller seeds and like pry them sometimes with tweezers. Um, and otherwise you just want to test for hardness. So for example, this lovely little um, bean, if this had any level of like give in it, if it didn't feel like a rock, and of course beans make it easy because it's big, but you'll see with the, with the flower seeds too. Um, if it's not solid, like super hard, you're like, hmm, I don't think you're dry. So there's in lieu of, and we don't have any fancy equipment, right? We have zero fancy equipment to say, now certifiably it's at 8%. Um, that's just technical jargon. But what I do know is that just err on the side of dry. And with wicking air, drying seeds is so much more effective with air moving rather than temperature in the same way that I am very Polish and among other things. And if it's above 90 degrees, I'm like, wow, it's way too hot out here. Um, so seeds are the same way and they will easily kind of frizzle and fry and lose their vigor and their capacity to just be robust, amazing seeds above 90, 95 degrees. And so you don't want to use temperature ever to dry your seeds. You do want air to dry them for you. So as long as it's above 65, ideally above 75 degrees, and then there's lots of moisture being wicked away with wind, amazing. So we literally have great big fans and they're blowing full bore on our seeds constantly, 24 hours a day. <laughs> so that it's just wicking that excess humidity away from the seeds. And as the seeds are releasing it, it's just being wicked away. So yes, use air to dry your seeds every time. So as soon as that, it's really dry, um, but to the touch, and if you're especially using fans to dry your seeds, you can be really confident that, all right, now it's time. Um, yeah, this is where like, it's handy to know these more technical things, but it's really nice to know that there are totally marvelous ways of intrinsically developing our senses of what is of what is really, really dry and that you'll only get by observation that even a really expensive, highly sophisticated instrument wouldn't be able to tell you potentially. Great question, my friend. And, you know, speaking now, of having all of these great seeds, what are some tips you would recommend for storing them? Awesome. So yeah, we have, I have a whole blog about this too. And tons of awesome info and there's a whole infographic that I made on our website too. But basically you want to keep seeds dark. You want to keep seeds dry and you want to keep seeds as cool as possible, but with a stable temperature. So if you have something, a place that gets really cold, but it's not a stable temperature, that's actually less ideal than somewhere that's warmer, but is at a stable temperature. So there is, again, the 100 rule, which um, if you have like a more sophisticated equipment is handy where the temperature plus humidity needs to be less than 100. So our seed cooler, we keep it at 20 degrees and the humidity is about 20% and we're constantly trying to get it less and less and less. So 20 plus 20 is 40. It's way under 100. Thank goodness. So that's just a fun little like um, this little check in. But basically, honestly, the vast majority of seeds will last four to five years and not lose a ton of germination, even in your kitchen cupboard where it's nice and dark and it's nice and dry and the temperature is pretty stable. Not super warm, but also not super cold, but it's that stability. Um, is it at optimal? There's a reason that, you know, <laughs> Svalbard and all the, <laughs> you know, seed repositories of the world um, are like keeping them in the permafrost <laughs> and super, super, super cold. But that's for long-term storage, right? You can also keep seeds in your freezer too, um, in which case I recommend having the desiccant packets three days before you put them in the freezer and even just pack the desiccant packet in the freezer with your seeds just for 
peace of mind. Um, but yeah, with very few exceptions, things like parsnips, leeks, anything in the allium family. So onions, leeks, shallots, scallions, they all have really weak, fragile seed coats and they quickly oxidize. So those seeds you really need to be saving slash buying fresh every year. And there's some herbs that are persnickety, but honestly, the vast majority of seeds, three years, five years, they should be germing. If they were high quality seeds to begin with, they should be germing well, even a few years later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just answered Laura's question about why onion seeds only last two, three years. So their oh. the seed coat is basically oxidizing and then they dry out, is that? Totally, totally, totally. And the oxidation is like, you know, seeds breathe just like you and I. Um, and so when they quickly, when there's more airflow and more oxidation, more air exchange, um, they're breathing faster, which takes more and, and like metabolizing more, which takes more energy. And so that seed, right, this seed is an endosperm. Like this is the energy that the seed needs to germinate, to create its cotyledons, to grow. And so all of that energy from the next generation is packed into every single seed. But if it, that energy is being used to just simply respire, it doesn't last as long. So if that seed coat is, is really um, light and fragile, re readily fractures, and there's a lot of air exchange, it's going to be metabolizing all of that energy faster is another way to think about it. Um, yeah, so the last piece, um, unless there's any other questions about any of those other crops that I've shared. We're, uh, we're coming up on 6.30. Oh, great. Time, so we have five more minutes. Nice. Well, I'll just briefly share about, I wanted to talk about garlic and shallots um, because those are also crazy easy seeds to save. Um, and of course, they're not seeds, they're vegetative clonal, um, although some of them do make seeds, which is really exciting. Um, but just another, just like I'm sure you probably, everyone probably already knows this, but just in case, a quick recollection of Yes, we are seed selectors, not seed savers. And it's those biggest, most beautiful bulbs that you want to eat most that you, I highly recommend do not eat. And you simply save. Because that planting, the, there's what you reap is what you sow. So save the biggest, save the healthiest. And every year, they'll be that much healthier. Um, and we share our garlic seed and shall um, shallots as well. Actually, next Monday, um, the 10th is when um, they go live on our website. Um, and we have lots of great info about them as well. Actually, I have a whole um, seed gar garlic and shallot growing academy. I do lots of online courses as well. And so there's just hours of video tutorials broken down by season um, so that I'm sharing with you all these nitty gritty nuances of how to grow um, awesome garlic and shallots. And we just made this online course free. It's a hundred dollar course and we just made it free because it's this moment where we are all losing so much stability, financial security, and we're, and so it's more important that we be more generous than ever. And it's so important that we be growing food and sharing everything we can as abundantly as we possibly can. So we just decided to make it totally free. So everyone has access to all this amazing information. So we all can be surrounded by amazing abundance. Um, so yeah, I'd love to open up the last couple minutes for just what other question you have, friends. And I know we've only just begun. There's so much more to share and don't be shy. Laura, that, is that a suggestion that you're, you're looking for, saving seed for biennial plants? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Petra. I love that. Oh, my pleasure. Great I to see you. Of you doing the Calabos um, cabbage saving. My favorite. Oh, <laughs> I love Calabos so much. I'm so glad that you're enjoying it. Yeah, there's, there's some really, 
Yeah, mm. that biennials are definitely a whole other sen- scenario. Maybe next year, NOFA, we can do a biennial um, talk because that those are kind of, I mean, I'll probably say they're all my favorites at different points, but I just think biennials are so much fun to save seed of. Seeing a cabbage, actually where this tripod is now standing, so where my phone is now and sharing, there we grew the calibos right here and we just harvested it last week the seed and so we planted those we grew the seeds actually collaborated with our friend nathaniel in um, trumansburg to grow out the heads last fall and then he harvested the heads shared them with his csa we had flagged all the plants that we wanted to save for seed and then we came in and after well after frost dug up all the plants with flags and hauled them back to our root cellar and <laughs> this they had these like stumps of cabbages without even the head on them and then replanted them right here in this beautiful row in this high tunnel and they got to be almost seven feet tall oh. just massive hundreds of thousands of flowers it was just ludicrous all like so many hummingbirds so there was a <laughs> there was a, a song sparrow that nested in one of the plants and yeah yeah, just last week they you know it looked really similar to this this is arugula um but they of course look really similar so we just harvested all those beautiful seed heads and yeah so i'm so glad you're enjoying it and <laughs> have you tried saving its seed before uh not on biennial just on the um just the ones you went over yeah cool awesome what seeds are you saving this season um, we saved some cilantro and dill and um, tomato and garlic Aww. and bitter melon. Oh, cool. I love you. That's amazing. <laughs> Do you have any seed saving tips to share with everybody? There's, I mean, we'll spend the rest of our lives learning and sharing. No, yeah. I actually don't. It's sort of, it's sort of uh, uh, accidental that um, <laughs> did the bitter melon only because I have a customer that wanted it and I couldn't find any organic seeds. So. Cool. Amazing. I love it. I love it so, so, so much. But thank you yeah, actually, for everything you do. Are you growing um, your ginger out in New York uh, year after year? No. So yeah, that is so yeah, full disclosure, we grow like 70% of our seeds on our farm. And then we collaborate with a lot of other growers in the Northeast and to, to source seeds from them. We also have some um, partners on the West Coast that we source seed from. And then there are some seeds that we get from larger seed houses um, that we don't have personal connections with. Um, and that's about that's about five percent of our seeds so 95 percent of our seeds are coming from like our bioregion which is really exciting um but our ginger comes from our friend howard in hawaii and he every year we'd get rhizomes from him and share them and grow them and they grow amazingly we've tried saving the rhizomes over and is it technically possible yes they are so not impressive. They're so depressed. They're so sad. And once ginger gets stressed, my experience of, of them is that they just get so stressed and sad. And so it never really recovers. So <laughs> does it technically does it technically grow again? Yes. But does it grow sweet and large and luscious? not no so honestly of everything that we share that is the least sustainable least tenable so yeah thank you for asking and we i try to share share that to be like this is coming from our friend howard in hawaii but it's really good to know that if there's any i don't want to give any impression that we're saving this that we're saving ginger seed because um or rhizomes to then share because we're definitely not we're not regionally adapting it so Thank you for asking. You know, and the uh, is it another collaboration of yours from Row Seven. Um, we that's an interesting question. So we have a very fascinating relationship with Row Seven. My partner Matthew um, co-founded Row Seven as well as Fruition Seeds, and um, and the collaborations that the kinds of collaborations that Fruition Seeds was doing with farmers. 
um, including, and with chefs, including Michael Mazurik at Cornell and Dan Barber at Blue Hill, um, Michael Mazurik at Cornell and Dan Barber at Blue Hill. It was our collaborations um, across the years that inspired Dan and Michael to ask Matthew to um, found the seed company with them. So we, we do grow a lot of um, the hybrid seeds that they share um, here on our farm. And, and we, but there's honestly from some, you know, there were pretty different worlds, just um, kind of from, it's ridiculous to say investor standpoints. Um, so we don't, we don't collaborate with them um, in any kind of like public, public way, because that would be problematic um, okay. for yeah. investors <laughs> in full disclosure. <laughs> But yeah, and if you have any other questions, I can't wait to hear them. No, I loved the Badger Flame beat. I, that's why I asked. Yes, us too. Um, there's some really exciting, that's um, Erwin Goldman of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And he and one of his brilliant, um, Sylvie Hansen, one of his brilliant PhD students, ha are developing a lot of new awesome beats and we're growing several this year and to save seed um, for next year. So we'll be able to share. Blushing, not bashful. I am probably just, whoa, going, getting way ahead of myself, but watch out. Blushing, not bashful is my new favorite beat. And it's way, it's, um, it's white with like these beautiful rose, um, like blushes throughout it. And it's super sweet. It's just like badger flame, like eat it raw. It, there's no other way and but it's it doesn't have like the yellow the yellow genetics in beets is just so problematic it's so finicky really it's just the germination is and the vigor is just it's it's really poor um so it has like all of those awesome qualities um without being a yellow beet so it just it's so much easier to grow so Yes! Spoiler alert! There's amazing, there's University of Wisconsin-Madison is amazing and Irwin is continuing to make more amazing varieties for us all. Thank goodness for public plant breeders. <laughs> um, but I'm sure I'm, I want to, maybe I'll just finish with the end of this article that I wrote for Small Farms Journal called, you know, We Are All Plant Breeders Now. Um, and yeah, we're about to because I just love to, I just, I really, really, it's really important to me that as people interested in seed saving, that you feel so empowered to know that you are changing the world and that we are all, even if you never sow seeds, you're impacting the food system. And certainly if you are saving seeds, like if you're sowing seeds, you're impacting the food system at the next level. And the next level above that is just seed saving. And the more intentionally you do it, the more profoundly you're impacting the world. And it's such a privilege to be able to, I mean, like it's literally determining what happens for the rest of time on this planet to be saving and then to be sharing seeds. Um, so yes, what are you waiting for? Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see in the world. And what if we save the seeds we wish to sow in the world? George Orwell penned, those who control the present control the past. And those who control the past control the future. So never doubt, you come from a great lineage of farmer plant breeders, we all do. And even if we never sow a single seed in our lives, every meal we serve, the food systems of the future. When Will Bonsall says, let's not leave this up to the professionals, let's all rise. We are all plant breeders now. Let us make it deliberate. Oh, and delicious. <laughs> So, yes, um, don't be shy. I am at your service, friends. I hope that this is just the beginning of many conversations to come on seeds, on seed saving, on plant breeding, on new amazing varieties and new amazing moths and whatever else that we're noticing in our lives. And yes, it is more important than ever that we remember we're not alone in the world. And I just am so grateful for you reminding me that I am not alone tonight. And thank you again, Doug.
thank you again, NOFA. And I can't wait for summer conferences to be embodied again. And in the meantime, way to make some phenomenal lemonade. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Petra, for all that great information and all that great insight. And thank you for joining the NOFA Summer Conference. Oh, 